Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. I just want to read uh, some snippets from this book, Nothing But The Truth by Brian Edwards, Evangelical Press. Uh, this is an excellent book, I'd encourage you to get it, it's still published today by Evangelical Press. Uh, it's probably one of the best books on the inspiration and authority of the Bible that you can get hold of. It's by Evangelical Press, Brian Edwards, uh, who was an excellent uh, preacher of the FIEC, Federation of Independent Evangelicals. And uh, this is a, a brilliant, brilliant book, and I'd encourage you to get hold of it. Evangelical Press by Brian Edwards, Nothing But The Truth. And uh, I just want to read a few snippets from it. And just talk about it just for a minute, just to encourage us. He says, uh, page uh, 35, chapter, What We Mean By Inspiration. From here on, it's God's revelation in the Bible that is our concern. And if, as we have already claimed, the Bible is without error, we must begin to support such a big statement with some evidence. To do this, we have to begin with the Bible itself. But to say that the Bible is the Word of God and therefore without error because the Bible itself claims that this is seen by many as an argument in circles. It is rather like saying, that prisoners must be innocent because he says he is. Are we right to appeal to the Bible? He goes on. If men were not sinners, witness to oneself would be enough. In John chapter 5, verse 31, 32, our Lord agreed with the principle that self-witness is normally not sufficient. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another one who testifies in my favour, and I know that this testimony about me is valid. In John chapter 5, verse 31, 32. Then in John 8, 13, the Pharisees took up the point when Jesus claimed, I am the light of the world. They corrected him by saying, Here you are, appearing to your own witness, and your testimony is not valid. In defence of our Lord showed that in this case, because he was the Son of God, self-witness is reliable. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. The following verses make clear our Lord's position that self-witness is reliable where sin does not interfere. Because Christ has never found to be false witness and no one could prove him guilty of sin, John 8, 46. His words could be trusted. In the same way, since the Bible is never found to be a false witness, we have a right to listen to its own claims about itself. This self-authentication, as it is often called, is used frequently in our daily experience. When a man writes his own life story, much of it can never be checked because it would never be known unless the author revealed it. He may write about his childhood fears or memories and we must take his word for these things. We either believe what he says or call him a liar. The same is true when I relate a dream I had recently. No one can possibly confirm or deny my account since I am the only witness. In this case, you rely entirely on self-authentication and you either trust me or you don't, depending on how trustworthy you have proved me to be. This is exactly Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, when he writes, Who among me knows the thoughts of man except a man's spirit within him? The same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Much of the Bible story is such that unless God had revealed it, we could never have known it. There are many scientific theories telling us how the world came into being. Some of these theories differ slightly from each other, but others are contradictory. This only shows that men can never really be sure about such matters, because no scientist was there when it happened. Unless, unless God, who was there, had revealed it, we would never have known it. The same is true for all great Bible doctrines. When men want to confirm that what they are saying is true, they appeal to someone or something greater than themselves. 
They swear on a holy book or say God is my witness. God has no one greater than himself to confirm his word and therefore he appealed to his own character. When God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for himself to swear by, he swore by himself. Hebrews 6.13 In law, the final court of appeal, whether it is a judge, governor or prince, president or king, must be the final authority. There is no higher authority. Therefore, if the Bible is God's word, it must be its own witness. There is no higher authority than God to witness to his truth. Hilary of Pointers, a 4th century theologian, once claimed, only God is fit to witness to himself. No one can improve on that. This was the principle our Lord left in John chapter 10, verse 37 and 38. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does, but if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may learn and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. This principle ran through the Old Testament also. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. Deuteronomy 8, 21, 22. If the Bible can be proved true wherever we can test it, then we are right to accept its word in those areas where we cannot test it. It is therefore essential that the Bible is seen to be accurate in its history, geography and prophecy, areas we often can test in order for us to trust its doctrine, which is an area we cannot test. A prisoner on trial is more readily believed when he says things we cannot check, if he has been proved right in the thing we can check. If the author writing his own life story is proved wrong on many of his supposed facts, then we are hardly willing to trust his word for those childhood fears and memories either. The accuracy of the Bible in its facts helps us to prove its own claim to be God-given book. The Witness of Christ and the Holy Spirit During his lifetime, my Lord witnessed to the inspiration of the Old Testament, a subject we shall return in chapter 4 and the Holy Spirit witness in the mind of the Christian. So often a young Christian accepts the authority of God's word without being told he must. It was through that word he became a Christian, and the same book speaks with a living power to his mind and heart each day. To deny the claim of Christ and the witness of the Holy Spirit is to make God a liar. The Bible is a book that speaks for itself. We shall begin by the study of 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. The phrase God-breathed is found only in this verse, in the whole of the Bible. It is just one word in the Greek and is often translated by the word inspired. Usually the word is explained as the divine in breathing into a man by God's Holy Spirit, with the result that the man speaks or writes with a quality, insight, accuracy and authority that are possible in no other form of speaking or writing. The word may be defined in this way, but it ought not to be. Inspire is an old French word and it was not used to refer to the scriptures until the Reformation in the 16th century. The Greek word is theopenoustos, which literally means God, theos, and breed penoustos. Our word theology comes from the Greek word of God. Theology is the study of God. Our words penoumenoi and penomatic are derived from the Greek word breed. They refer to breathe or air. To be accurate, 2 Timothy 3.16 does not mean breathed into by God, but breathed out by God. There is a big difference between breathing into something and breathing out, inspiring and expiring. In this verse, there is really no reference to the human writer at all. Another passage in the Bible tells us about the human writers in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 to 21 and we shall look at that later but in 2 Timothy 3.16 there is no reference to the method by which we receive the scripture but to its origin, where it came from. It is not breathed into man but breathed out by God. That is a very big claim. Benjamin Wallfield, a brilliant biblical scholar in the United States earlier this century and he carefully studied this word uh, Theop. Penustos and it 
uh, in all its uses outside the Bible. In chapter 6 of his book, The Inspiration and Authority of the Bible, he shows that it is always used in a passive sense, something that is breathed out and never in an active sense, breathing into something. The emphasis on where the words came from, they were breathed out by God, and not on what happened to the human writer, God actively breathing into human words. If I say to a man, how do you get that new car I see in your garage? He may reply, it was sold to me by a friend of mine, or he may say, I drove it home from my friend's house. Both answers are correct, but the first tells me where the car came from. You notice the passive use of the verb, it was sold to me. On the other hand, the second answer tells me how the car came to me to be in my friend's garage. I drove it home. And that is an active use of the verb. Theopanustos is passive. It tells us where the words came from. The word inspiration is therefore misleading and not strictly scriptural. However, it has become a technical term and we shall have to continue to use it, though with the correct understanding, God breathed is an excellent translation of the word Theopanustos. If inspired really means God breathed, then we must accept that all scripture, being God-breathed, is accurate, without error, and can therefore be detrusted completely. God would cease to be God if he breathed out errors and contradictions, even in the smallest part. So long as we give Theopanistos its real meaning, we shall not find it hard to accept the full inerrancy of the Bible. Whether some people do find it hard to accept this, as we saw in the first chapter, many a very liberal view of scripture, and they will not accept the supernatural, such as miracles, nor will they trust the words of Moses, Paul, or even the Lord himself. Others accept the words of our Lord, but believe that Paul, John, or Peter were not always correct. Still others believe that the doctrines revealed in the Bible are reliable, and so most, of, but not all, of the historical facts. A view held by many today is that the words of God are not to be found in the Bible at all, but the Bible becomes the word of God when it speaks to man. This was the dangerous modern view put forward by the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, to whom we referred in chapter 1. To various extents of these views denies the true meaning of Theopanustos. Excuse me, plenary or verbal inspiration, a new approach. These two words are sometimes used to explain what evangelicals really mean when they speak about the Bible as God's word. Plenary comes from the Latin plenus, which means full, and refers to the fact that the whole of scripture is every part is God's given. Verbal comes from the Latin verbum, which means word, and emphasizes that even the words of scripture are given, God given. By definition, plenary and verbal inspiration means that the Bible is God-given and therefore without in error in every part, doctrine, history, geography, dates, names and so on, and in every single word. But unfortunately, some evangelicals today use these words plenary and verbal, but mean something different. They say there are errors in the Bible, just small ones here and there, but these need not be counted against plenary and verbal inspiration because the facts of the Bible intended to stay are what matters. An example is found in 1 Chronicles 21, 12, where David experienced three years of famine as a result of his disobedience. In 2 Samuel 24, 13, it is referred to as seven years. We are told not to waste time trying to resolve the problem. The fact of famine lasting a few years is what God intended, and in that the Bible is absolutely right and completely reliable. Just how we can resolve this particular problem is discussed in John in chapter 17. Of course, there is a proper use of discovering what the Bible intends to say, and we shall look at that in chapter 14. But to use intention to cover up possible errors is incorrect. It is like a football team discounting all goals scored against it by the argument that it was never its intention to let the ball into the net. Such reasoning may satisfy supporters, but certainly not its opponents. 
A witness to crime may give a lot of detail to the court, but if many of them are proved to be completely false, the witness cannot be allowed to plead. Well, what I intended to say was that I saw the crime and, in the, and that everyone agrees I am right. The fact is that he lied, or at best has proved himself an unreliable witness, and no court will listen to him further. We must watch for those who use the term plenary and verbal, but only in a limited way. This new thinking by some evangelicals is the top of a slippery slope into full liberalism. After all, liberalism first started by allowing just a little accepted error here and there in the Bible. History is just repeating itself. To talk of an infallible Bible in spite of its errors is a misuse of plain words and simply dishonest. The only safe and consistent attitude to the Bible is to be seen as a book without error. Why is inerrancy important? Is this whole debate about whether or not the Bible contains nothing but the truth and only a theological quibble? Certainly not. The question of ultimate authority is of the highest importance for the Christian and for a number of good reasons. Inerrancy governs our attitude to the truth of the gospel. We cannot offer the world a reliable gospel presented in an unreliable scripture. How can we be sure of truth on any issue if we are suspicious of errors everywhere or in anywhere? An airline pilot would ground his aircraft even on suspicion of the most minor faults because he is aware that one fault destroys confidence in the complete machine. If the history contained in the Bible is wrong, how can we be sure that the doctrine or moral teaching is correct? The answer is that we cannot be sure. Some theologians claim that it is real message of the biblical writer that is important, and that if the writer is incorrect in a number of facts or even makes them up, it does not alter the truth of this message. But in no other area of life would we accept this argument. A farmer wishing to sell his cow to a neighbour may describe it in great detail, its size, weight, food and intake of milk output, its age and characteristics and then add its brown in colour. If on the following day he arrives with a black and white cow, his neighbour will quite rigidly distrust all the important details given the previous day. Either it is different cow or the farmer does not know his animals. When I collect my car from a service, I notice that although the list of items be checked, including refilling, the windscreen wash bottle, the machine clearly had not done so. The foreman suggested it was a very small item, but I pointed out that if they missed something so obvious and simple, I had good reason to question what else of greater importance they might have overlooked. The gospel of salvation may sound wonderful, but if the history in which it is all said to have happened is not correct, then how can we trust the gospel itself? The heart of the Christian message is rooted in history. The incarnation of God becoming man is proved by the virgin of Christ, redemption, the price being paid for man's rebellion, to be forgiven. It is obtained by the death of Christ on the cross, reconciliation, the privilege of the sinner, becoming a friend of God is gained through the resurrection and ascension of Christ. If the recorded events are not true, how do we know that the theology behind them is, is true? Does the Bible claim to be God-breathed without error? The answer to this question is certainly yes. Some of the strongest critics of the Bible, who themselves deny inerrancy, have admitted that was clearly the belief of our Lord and the Apostles. The German theologians Adolf Harnack, 1851-1930, Rudolf Bultmann, 1884-1976, are examples of this. F.C. Grant of Union Seminary in the United States of America, a very liberal critic, of the Bible has written of the New Testament. Everywhere it is taken for granted that what is written in the scripture is the work of divine inspiration and is therefore trustworthy, infallible and inerrant. He then added, what is described or related in the Old Testament is unquestionably true. We shall look at the biblical position very briefly here and return to the chapters. The Old Testament writers saw their message as God breathed and therefore utterly reliable. 
God confirmed this to Moses, the future prophets, in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will raise up for the prophet like you from among the brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command them. This was also Jeremiah's experience at the beginning of his ministry. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. The Hebrew word for prophet means a spokesman, and the prophet's message was, This is what the Lord says. As a result, they frequently so identified themselves with God that they spoke as though God himself was actually speaking. Isaiah 5 reveals this clearly. In verses 1 and 2, the prophet speaks of God in the third person, he, but in verse 3 and 6, there is a change, and Isaiah speaks in the first person, I. Isaiah has become the actual voice of God. It is little wonder that King David could speak of the word of the Lord as flawless in 2 Samuel 22:31. And Proverbs 30, verse 5. Our Lord believed in verbal inspiration. Clearly, our Lord believed that the words of the Old Testament we God read. Here are three examples. John 10, 34, quoting Psalm 82, 6. Our Lord based his teaching upon, I said, you are God's. In Matthew 22, 32, he based his teaching upon the words, I am. In Exodus 36. etc. So we're going to just look at what the church said first 500 years of what the church believed about inspiration of the Bible. Clement of Rome, writing to the church at Corinth in the first century, reminded them, you have studied scripture, he was referring to the Old Testament, which contains the truth and is inspired by the Holy Spirit. You realize that there is nothing wrong or misleading in it. A similar way, Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trifo, a Jew he was seeking to win for Christ, claimed, I am entirely convinced that no scripture contradicts another. Tertullian led the church in Carthage, North Africa, in the 2nd century, and argued that whatever the scripture teaches is true and binding upon us, and Clement of Alexandria called it the first principle of instruction, because in it we hear the voice of the Lord. Irenaeus represented the Greek church in the 2nd century and wrote, The scriptures are indeed perfect, since they were spoken by the word of God and his spirit. Despite claims to the contrary, there can be little reasonable doubt that the reformers in the 16th century also followed the position of the early church leaders. Not only was the watchword of the Reformation sold as scripture, scripture alone, but it was scripture that, according to Martin Luther, cannot err. Unfortunately, Luther sat loosely to this at times, as is evidenced in his commentary on Zechariah 1528, when he raised the question why Matthew should attribute Zechariah 11.13 to Jeremiah. Uh, see Matthew 27 9 and concluded with the possibility that Matthew is not quite correct about the name. Elsewhere, however, he maintained it is impossible that scripture should contradict itself. It only appears so to senseless and obstinate hypocrites. Luther also refers to the scriptures which have never erred and claims that one letter, even a single title of scripture, means more to us than heaven and earth. The later reformers and Puritans followed the same line, but with one notable difference. Until the end of the 17th century, there was little dispute among the Catholic Protestants regarding biblical infallibility. The eloquent John Eck advised his friend, Listen, dear Erasmus, do you suppose that any Christian will patiently endure to be told that the evangelists of the gospel made mistakes? And Archbishop James Usher calculated the year of uh, creation as 4000 BC on the basis of the absolute reliability of biblical dates. However, with the, the, the age of the Enlightenment, free thinking led to scepticism, and the Protestants began to tighten their terms of reference. William Whitaker, a Cambridge scholar, published his Deputation on the Holy Scriptures, 1588. He believed unquestionably in biblical inerrancy, and he demonstrated that this was the view of the Church Fathers in the early centuries. Whitaker claimed we must maintain intact the authority of Scripture, 
in such a sense as not to allow that anything therein delivered otherwise than the most perfect truth required. Whitaker was typical Puritan and believed that this infallibility related to the original documents written by the biblical writers. He was followed by William Ames, the marrow of sacred divinity. By the 18th century, uh, were evangelicals were in no doubt. If there be one error in scripture, concluded John Wesley, the preacher and evangelist, there might well be a thousand. It would not be the truth of God. And A.A. Hodge and B.B. Warfield, the Princeton theologians of the late 19th and early 20th century, were no inventors of new things when they spelled out the detail of biblical inerrancy. Offered clear scriptural reasons for the doctrine. They were simply following a long history of mainstream Christianity. Professor Kersop Lake at Harvard University can be permitted the final word on the question of how old the evangelical view of the Bible it is we liberals who have departed from the tradition, he said. So, if we turn to uh, Psalm 119, and I'm just going to read some words and just share my thoughts what Jonathan Edwards has said, uh, what Brian Edwards has said. So there, there's the book. You can get hold of the book. Brian H. Edwards, Evangelical Press. Okay. Nothing but the truth. Brian Edwards, Evangelical Press. Now, there's quite a lot of videos going up this week because I've been to Holland. I'll be putting up uh, some of the things that happened in Holland and, and stuff. I've also made quite a few thoughts while I've been away. And I've done some teaching today, a bit of teaching, so they'll go up as well. Now this is an extra video amongst all that extra material, and you might think, well, why have you done another one? But I think it's so important to get this right about Scripture, that if we get this wrong, we're, we're finished. So we need to be so right on the Word of God. And I believe that there's a trend that has been growing and it's bigger than we think, a big, big trend, where new ideas have come about Scripture, about what the nature of Scripture is. So there's a, a trend that has happened that says, well, it, it's not the, the, the full words of the Bible that's important, it's just the message that's important. There are faults in the, in the Bible, but it's okay, so long as we have the message and it's so important to remember that this is not what the Bible teaches and it's not what the early church taught or the reformers or the Puritans and it's a new view and, it, and it's a very dangerous view because once you let, it, it's done with the best intentions it's done by people who love the Lord, who love the word of God but it, it, and it's done because it seems wise it's done with the best intentions, but without realising they departed from what the Bible says, they departed what the church says throughout history, and thirdly, they don't realise the implications of what they're saying. The moment you say there are faults in the Bible, just one little fault, then the whole thing collapses. You might say, well, there are manuscripts that have mistakes in you can find contradictions in the in, in the Bible translation in, say, various parts of the Bible. So, you know, we just have to accept that so long as we've got the message. This is a dangerous view, and, it, and it's not biblical. It's not a, a view shared by the Lord Jesus Christ or the apostles. It's not a view shared by the early church. And I just want to keep bringing it. I want to bring this home. I've done a video on this. I'm going to bring it home to you and I want to encourage you to buy this book buy this book Brian Edwards nothing but the truth evangelical press please buy this book and read it read it and digest it and pray over it so that you've got a sound understanding of the inspiration and authority of the Bible uh, if you're a pastor buy copies of this book Hand it to your congregation, 
and do us do studies together as elders and leaders. Study this book together. As missionaries, pass this book to each other and just get hold of this book. Buy this book. Read it. Buy copies of this book. And ask people to read it and sit down with them and talk to them about it. Um, it's really an important book to read and it's really helpful. And it will really knock on its head this view that the message is important, but the words, if there are a few faults, it doesn't matter, so long as we've got the, the message. Um, so I'm just going to read some views and that, read, read some verses. And then I'm just going to give my own thoughts uh, about the, these, this, this issue. Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled, verse 1, in the way who walk in the law of the, the, law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep the precepts diligently. All that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes, then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, and I will keep the statutes or forsake me not utterly. Wherefore shall a man, a young man, keep his way by taking heed according to thy word? According to thy word. How do, we, how do we keep clean? But according to the word of God. So let me just talk about this. Let me just share with you some, thought, some, some uh, basic thoughts. When the Lord was dealing with the devil, the Lord quoted scripture the Old Testament. And he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So right there, when he's fighting the devil, he's fighting on with the word of God. No suggestion of error, no suggestion of that the words are not important. Absolute confidence on the individual words and the inspiration of the Old Testament in its words. So our Lord never had this teaching that it was the message important but not the words, right? When the devil came to Adam and Eve, the Lord told Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve is the fruit, if you eat it, you will die. The Lord gave his word, he gave a command in his word. When the devil came, the devil said, did God say that? So the devil questioned the word of God and Adam and Eve had a choice to either hear the word of God or to disobey. They disobeyed the word of God. And what that showed you, the history of the human race is those who will hear the word of God and those who will disobey. Now, since the Enlightenment, since the 17th, 18th century, man has exalted his reason. And the devil has tried to undermine the authority and inspiration of the Bible in our Western culture by exalting the mind or exalting feeling, one or the other. So you had the uh, rationalist uh, philosophers like Immanuel Kant, who wrote the Critic of Pure Reason, and David Hume, the... Um, Kant was the Prussian philosopher, you had David Hume, the British empiricist who believed in reason and science. Um, man 
exalting his reason. Then you had the Romantic movement, you had poets and, who, who exalted uh, feeling like Lord Byron. So there was always this in the Western culture of that time, a desire to undermine the Bible. Feelings or rationalism. And in, in the midst of all that, in the midst of this cultural change in the Enlightenment, there were theological seminaries in, in, in Europe and in America that were very orthodox, very sound in their faith. We had great Puritan theologians who, who were even chancellors, even working in some of the big universities like John Owen, the sound men of faith. But the Enlightenment came and and because you had these secular poets and secular philosophers began to impact the seminaries. So you had a, a scholar, a German scholar called Schleimacher. Schleimacher comes, comes at the tail end of the Enlightenment. In the 18th, in the 19th century, Schleimacher said that uh, what matters is that religion, the Christian faith, is grounded not in the Word of God, but in the dependence on Christ. Sounds very reasonable. But what he did there is he cut people off from the importance of the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Liberal Protestants began to say, Christian uh, Protestants are worshipping the Bible, they need to worship Christ. Sounds very plausible, but what they're trying to do is get the church to move away from the Bible where you can find the biblical Christ to a Christ of their own invention with their philosophical tools. And these pressures were brought to bear on the theological seminaries during the Enlightenment and right through up into the 19th century. And the Christian view that the Bible is fully inspired came under massive attack by theologians within and then you had on top of that you had philosophers and poets poets especially emphasizing feeling you had philosophers emphasizing reason the theologians began to take that on board and began to manipulate the church to believe in different views of scripture in order to get them away from scripture so that they can move them into the new rationalist or cultural way of thinking that is not necessarily what the Bible teaches. On top of that, you had higher criticism, uh, new scholarship and criticising the Bible. Um, you had people like um, a guy called uh, Bauer, B-A-U-R, of the uh, early eight, 19th century, um, late 18th century. No, sorry, uh, mid 18th, 19th century, using Hegelian philosophy as a way of interpreting the Bible, saying that Paul's letters are not actually of Paul because of his Hegelian philosophy getting in the way. So, in other words, for like since the Enlightenment right up until the 19th century, there, there was a battering of the inspiration of the Bible, absolute battering. And it got into the church because the seminaries got captivated by 
these philosophical and cultural movements. And then when you got, uh, in the 19th century, Charles Darwin's evolution, and you had biblical criticism, it was like acid on the Bible. They, they really tore into the Bible. Now, coming into the 20th century, in America, America was able to hold the line a bit more than in the UK. America had more greater theologians and more theological seminaries that were able to stand for a while against biblical criticism and evolution. You had theologians like R.L. Dabney, Thornwell, uh, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield. Even they were beginning to be influenced by the culture of the day, Hodge and Warfield on, for example, evolution. But they were still holding the line against encroachments and attack upon the inspiration and authority of the Bible. So America had a stronger, stronger theological foundation. And also in Holland, you had uh, Hermann Bavink and Kuiper. You had brilliant theologians and they were able to hold the line for a while. But it, they couldn't hold the line long. So the early 20th century, you began to see, even in America and even in Holland, you began to see new ideas coming in about scripture. One of those ideas was a theologian called Karl Barth. Some say Barth or Barth, I say Barth. But Karl Barth was very um, influenced by philosophy. Um, as a student, he, he was trained by liberal theologians, he was trained by some of the greatest minds of the day. And these great minds, many of them, apart from Adolf Schlattler, were influenced by philosophy. And Karl Barth had imbibed a lot of philosophy. But he hit upon the idea of using orthodox theology, but hiding his philosophy. So he said, that what matters is the Bible, the message, and that message is Christ. It's not the words that are important, but it's the message. And the words only become relevant when the message is revealed. So when we read the word and we are revealed the message, that is the important point. He didn't believe in a full inspiration of the Bible. It was not an inerrant or infallible document. It had errors in it. But he came across as very orthodox. As very sound because he was using orthodox language. And it sounded sound. He sounded Christ-centered. But underneath, there was this philosophy that was hidden. And Karl Barth spread to Holland. He spread to America. He spread throughout the whole Western world. And so, in the early 20th century, right up until the twin, uh, uh, right up until um, the sixties, you had three. You had you had four strands. You had you had classic liberalism that said the Bible is a book about Jesus, but it's got errors in it and it's not fully inspired and. You evangelicals worship the Bible. You had new orthodoxy that said Christ is center of the Bible and it becomes inspired as we read it and it's revealed to us. But it's not, it hasn't got errors in it. The Bible's got errors in it. But we don't talk about that. The main thing is Christ. Then you had a general evangelical view that the Bible 
the words of, of God are inspired. And within that view, there were fundamentalists um, who had various understandings of inspiration of the Bible, like mechanical inspiration, etc. But they all, and, and then you had like the, the Princeton theologians like B.B. Warfield and Charles Hodge and Warfield died right about the 1920s. And uh, later on from Princeton, you had the Westminster Theological Seminary that took on that heritage of a, a kind of scholarly defense of the inspiration and authority of the Bible. So basically you had the liberals, you had the neo-orthodox, you had the evangelicals with various different views about inspiration, but they all believed the Bible is the word of God, uh, that there are no faults in it, the words are inspired. And then fourthly, you had the charismatic belief that you have the Bible and the Holy Spirit as in giving you extra revelation which began to grow in the 1960s. But then, as you move on into the later 20th century and coming into the 21st century, You have uh, a, a new wave of new evangelicals in America. So you have these four views and then in from the later 20th century, 1980s, 1990s, going right up to the present time. You not only have these four main views, the liberalism, the neo-orthodox, the classic evangelical view with various nuances from fundamentalists to Princeton theologians and the charismatic. You have on top of those four views a new, a new, a new view and that's modern evangelicalism. And basically modern evangelicalism is really not rooted in classic evangelical view of scripture. It, it kind of more to the liberal and neo-orthodox view and not in the classic evangelical view. And as the Western Church had become salt in secularization, the church has become secularized. It's wanted to reach out to people, it, modern evangelicalism, and in, in order to do that, it's become secularized because it's tried to be relevant to the times. And in its desire to be relevant to the times, it's compromised the truth. And so we have a new generation of theologians and pastors that that have tweaked the classical doctrine of inspiration. And it's very similar to neo-orthodoxy, it's very similar to liberalism. It's milder, but it's, it, it, it is what it is, it's a new view of scripture and basically the message is that the, 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 the view is the message is important but not the full inspired word. Now you've got to be careful because this view within that there are many views of that so you have on the left of this idea you have the emergent church and in the emergent church they basically say look This inspiration and authority of the Bible is putting people off. It's too rigid. Uh, when we're talking to people, they're not going to take on board that evolution is wrong. They're not going to take on board that the Bible is right in every area. We're just going to admit that there are faults in the Bible, but it doesn't matter. Jesus is the way. 
So these emergent church people have imbibed this idea and they really, really are, are, are liberal. They're, they're liberal evangelicals, really. Uh, they, they've swallowed the liberal agenda uh, and, and they've compromised the Bible. But then you have the right wing, you have people who take this view, but they take it for a different reason. These people take the view that there are faults in the Bible and the words aren't fully inspired properly. They take that view because they just want to reach people and no matter what, and so we can compromise on these issues so long as we're preaching Christ. That's the reason. But it's a dangerous thing because they've compromised truth and they've quite willingly jettisoned truth in order to reach people. These people on this side who say there are faults in the words, just a few, but the message is important, they, they have a more sincere heart in the sense that they do believe the Bible is inspired. Um, but they go off manuscripts. They, they go off the arguments from Dan Wallace and people like that, who say, who's a textual critic, and they say, look, we're, the Bible is 99% accurate in its text, but there are, in that 1%, faults, and there might be even uh, historical minor historical faults in the Bible. But it doesn't matter that the message is important. And so that's the kind of right-wing side. These people can be helped because they they have not, even though they might say that there are faults in the Bible because of this 1% in the manuscripts, in the heart of hearts, they do believe the Bible is inspired. In the heart of hearts, they are truly, solidly evangelical. They, they just don't fully understand the implication of what they're saying. So I want to clear up a few issues here. So, well, Jason, wait a minute. You're saying the Bible's fully inspired, there's no false book. You take your King James Bible, there, there are uh, errors in it in terms of like. You look at Chronicles, there are different contradictions. Our point is this, is that the Bible's inspired, but that means we've got to go to the original Hebrew manuscripts and we've got to find out in the Hebrew manuscripts how they were translated and if the translators have done the correct translation or if, if they've used the correct manuscripts. But the still point is the Bible's fully inspired without error. He said, well, what about the manuscripts? We, we've only got, we've got 99.9 .9 accuracy, but there's just one little bit of percent that we, we can't find or get accurate. You know, that is true in terms of manuscripts, but it's not true in terms of the Word of God. The Word of God is clearly fully inspired and every Word of God is inspired. So therefore... We have the human uh, work of, tra of uh, textual criticism and we have the human work of translation. But the principle that the Bible teaches that every word is inspired is a principle that we aspire to in our textual criticism. We don't give up on that principle and say there are faults or that there are mistakes in the Bible. No, we work at our textual criticism to get the best text and to work the te the, to, bring, to bring the right textual criticism and the right text to the table. I hope that makes sense. So for example, a Muslim might say to me, well the Bible's changed, the Bible's not the word of God, it's got f errors in, um, errors in, in, uh, in Chronicles it says 43,000 died and, and in Kings it says 33,000 there's a contradiction there right and uh, the last ending of Mark's not in there so it's not fully inspired it's got faults and bits missing there are two ways to look at it you could say to the Muslim the, the one view is 
Well, it doesn't matter about that passage in Mark. It doesn't matter. The main thing is to remember Jesus died for you. It doesn't matter about the contradiction in Chronicles. The main thing is Jesus died for you. The problem with that view is the Muslim is going to think there's a contradiction in the Bible. It's changed. I'm not going to listen to you. End of debate. Or if the Muslim comes to you and says there's last end of Mark missing and um, there are contradictions in Chronicles, you can say this, well the Bible says it's fully inspired. Look, look at it, it says it's inspired of God, God breathed. God has preserved his word and protected his word. We have over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. And if we look at the textual criticism, the last end of Mark is in the four families of the of, of ancient copying. And if you get it in four families, it shows you that is is an original. So I would say that the last end of Mark is actually in the Bible. And as for this contradiction in the Gospel, in the Chronicles of 33,000 and 43,000, well, the, the translator or the copyist of the Hebrew text has made a mistake. We need to go to the ancient manuscripts of the Septuagint and to see whether we can find the correct um, copying. But that doesn't mean to say there's a mistake in it. So now what you've done is you've defended the integrity of the biblical text. The Muslim is going to listen to you because his, his challenge has been dealt with. Now you could say to him, wait a minute, you've got contradictions in your Quran. Your Quran says that uh, God created the world in eight days and another one says six days you can translate it generations eight generations six generations eight days or six days whichever way you do it it's a contradiction even in the heat in the Arabic it's a contradiction you've definitely got a contradiction going on there and then you say and we do textual criticism you don't do textual criticism show me the text that's behind your surah chapter one surah one Where's the text behind that? You'll see Muslims dance up and down, jump up and down. They won't even begin to know how to deal with that. So you're defending the inspiration and authority of the Bible, and now you've put the Muslim on the back foot. But if you say, okay, there are faults. There is a contradiction there in the Chronicles. And yeah, I've got to admit that last ending of Mark's not there. And, and you know, there are bits in the Bible that shouldn't be there and uh, and there are bits that have been added and yeah you know but the main thing is the message the, the Muslim is going to just say end of story sayonara you've been dealt a blow you're dead there's no way you can come back you're you, if you've got errors in that book it could have errors